We are on. Here we are back. Episode 5, OSP TV. My team, my family, my OSP. Good to see you all. Thank you for joining us. As always, our co-host, the navigator, the guy that keeps us in line, the OG Woods. That's W-U-D-Z for all you rookies out there. OG, welcome back. <laughs> What's up, brother? I'm good, Matt. Good to see you again. Always. A couple more gray hairs since the last episode. Uh, even my barber told me that. Oh, he did? <sighs> yeah. Come right on. She. She. Yeah. I noticed these things. <laughs> <laughs> Our special guest, episode five, uh, great honor to have him, one of the <clears> best <throat> trainers in boxing today train the likes of the Klitschko's uh, the uh, undisputed heavyweight champions during their time uh, Triple G Gennady Golovkin the uh, middleweight champion of the world of course Badu Jack two division world champion and in his own right a uh, very accomplished professional also under the tutelage and uh, apprenticeship of the late great Emmanuel Stewart, Detroit's own one and only JB Jonathan Banks, sir. Welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you for having me. Huh? Huh. I'm loving being here, man. It's, well, we love great, having man. you. I love it. <laughs> we love having you, JB. So we're going to jump right into this. So uh, Jonathan and I have uh, worked together a few camps now, huh? Yeah, I feel like it's been about five. Thank six you so years. much for coming on, Jonathan. It's been great to have you on the show. Everybody, take care. <laughs> uh, but you you joined Badu's camp. Has it been two years? A year and a half? I feel like it's been two years. A little over two years. I think I think we're right because around. We had a lot of work together before anything really started popping off. Yeah, and I think Badu. Yourself and Badu was the reason I was in Vegas when the pandemic first really took hold. Oh, so that that has yeah, been yeah, right. So when the pandemic, when it, when people when, like when it, when we first start hearing about the pandemic, it was one thing. When people start getting sick, they saying people dying from it. I was in Vegas. I was oh, might wow. have been February. I want to say. Mm. Oh, that was it. That, was, yeah, yeah, that yeah, timing I, makes I was, sense. I was, yeah. in Feb, I was in Vegas working with Badu, so we been had a lot of time outside of anything scheduled to work. So it's been about two and a half years almost. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to remember when. Yeah, you're right. It has yeah. been about that. Um, you know, when, when, when Badu decided that, uh, you know, we're going to make a, a change in, in, in trainers and kind of take his career at a different, uh, a different narrative or a different path, we were looking at a couple of different trainers, and, and we saw some great ones. We, I think we narrowed it down to five or six by far, Jonathan, you were the ugliest out of all of them. Uh, that means a lot. That means yeah. a lot because you never want to be a pretty trainer. No, <laughs> never want to be a pretty. Good trainer. thing looks don't have anything to do. with Exactly, it. you don't want oh, to be. You don't man. want to be too pretty, man. Because if I'll you get you. hit, then you know, messes stuff up. We got to put your makeup on. So, yeah. so we had some great. We had a great a couple of options left, and uh, and 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 when it narrowed it down, there was two more trainers left. And right after Badu trained you, he goes, "That's the guy." I said, "Badu." We've got two more left. I, let's let's just try. It. He goes, no, 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 I'm good. I I know what I want, and I, I'm telling you, Jonathan. For two weeks before I called you, I was trying to convince him to go to the other two, but that chemistry just fit great, and you could see it in the gym now. You know the training camps that we've had, and this last one, which was on a huge stage, and yeah. you know I think it was a great performance. You know, granted the disheartening <laughs> news that uh, you know exactly for out of the real camp, you know, seven out of the eight weeks we're training for one guy and. They decided to take steroids, and his steroids took steroids. Exactly. And then those steroids took steroids. Yeah, exactly. They're still finding steroids. <laughs> Yo, he just popped for a fifth time. The that fifth is, one came that, back. That is yeah. insane. Man. Same one is still in the system. Yeah, so he just I kept just, loading it up and, you know. I just hate that um, that the sport that um, that I've grown, that I've, born, when I was, I've been loving since I was born, they don't have... It's not enough togetherness to have a harsh enough penalty to penalize these guys for for cheating. Because if it was, I think you would have a lot fewer guys going down the line getting tested positive. Okay, so let me play devil's advocate here, Jonathan. And, and Dustin, you can jump in here because I know you're a big sports guy and Dustin's pretty versed in a lot of sports. Let's play devil's advocate. Before, before we insinuate and we accuse of cheating, is there any way... That Pascal 
unknowingly took these steroids, Dustin? Yeah, I know why I think you're asking this. In his scenario, correct me if I'm wrong, but most of them were injectable. So The EPO I, definitely was. There's nothing. What else are you getting injected with? Maybe you know? he thought he was taking four COVID <clears throat> shots. You know, and I see some of the cases where, you know, you see just a, the, the, the popular term now is a picogram of something mm -hmm. that, you know, could be in a, a dietary substance or you know, ointment or something I, that maybe is a little bit different. Like take the John Jones case and MMA, you know, but this, <laughs> yeah. no, I had no picogram here. <laughs> <laughs> so yes or no, did he take it if, for based on the evidence that we see that it was injectable and that he, that for four weeks, five weeks afterwards, not only did he test oh, positive, is, you know, the second finish. test yeah, this was is higher straight cheating. And I, I agree. Like, I think if they put in a, a stiff penalty like you're banned from a organized fight and for three years something like that you're not going to see it as much but what what will happen you know he might get stripped of the title but then he can just go back and fight like what's going to happen i i don't know yet but, but before we go on jonathan did he willingly or unwillingly take those knowingly or unknowingly in my opinion he knowingly did it i think um 99.9 .9 of fighters in the sport of boxing have tested positive for steroids, have willingly taken them. Wow. Okay. So, and again, those are opinions that that we have. Uh, I I know I know Pascal's manager. He was shocked when that came through, and he lost you know a significant uh, payday that that fight. Um, I I know uh, uh, Troy Ross, who's in camp with him, I, and, and he see from what I know, Troy is an absolute gentleman. I don't, I don't think I he, know Troy as well. He's very high character, yeah, very yeah. high character, I very agree. high character. Um, so you know you have to go back and, and look at you know the other people that are around him, and you know it is what it is. But at the end of the day, the fight didn't happen. Badu couldn't get his revenge. Uh, Pascal, I, I believe, is going to be stripped in these next couple of weeks of the title. Uh, they are foregoing the, uh, uh, I think the B sample. I don't think they're going to be doing that. Well, at least I haven't heard that they're going to be doing that. So, having said that, I think that you know that title becomes vacated, and then you know we see what happens to him. But a fighter, I mean, the only means of his income is by fighting. So maybe a, a harsh three-year penalty is enough to to. Uh, what should the penalty be? You know what? Um, without any type of em emotion in involved in the penalty, um, I kind of think it needs to be something that kind of goes on the record as far as almost it's almost criminal. Because if we if we engage in a mutual combat sport, okay, and we both agree to fight outside in the back. We both agree to it, paper sign, liability sign. And the second you start taking advantage of me, I pull out a knife that I snuck in and I cut you. Mm -hmm. And somehow you end up bleeding out or you get paralyzed. Something, something detrimental like that happened to you. My punishment shouldn't be I can't do this with for a couple of years, then I go right back to doing it. Right. My livelihood stay the same. Nothing changes. So with no change, you get no change. So so are you saying that maybe there should be a trial? It should be a criminal charge? I can't go that far on the record and say that. But I what I will say what I will say if um the commissioners and the sanction body and the and the, the advisors slash promoters, they really is the ones, and the managers really is the ones who's keeping this, the 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 sport of boxing as a melting pot, stirring it. They are the ones that's there's a lot when fighters to fight and stuff like that. I think it need to be one voice to come together that if you get caught doing this, not only is it a harsh penalty, you know, but something need to come, something need to happen that's indefinitely. Okay. Dustin, what do you think? Yeah, What's the I mean, penalty? I think in you see it in a lot of sports. The first uh, time you caught, it's just it's kind of a slap on the wrist. Like I think football, it's like six game suspension. You know, so if I it, I try to put my mind in you know an athlete that 
maybe they're getting influence or things aren't going their way or whatever. And they're like, well, if I don't get caught and even if I do the first time, it's only six months, but hang on, Dustin, six games, whatever. The first punishment needs to be harsher. Yeah, but Jonathan brought this point up and I've been thinking about it ever since he said it. It's a combat sport. You know, you're not taking it to throw further or jump higher or run faster. And in football, that is the case. In boxing, you're actually going to cause bodily harm, long-term harm, 100%. You know, physical harm to your opponent. So it's it, it's giving you a different kind of edge. And and I think I think your example is right on. You pull a knife out, what happens? That's a criminal charge. You know, I'm trying to be as biased about this as possible, or unbiased rather about this as possible. But you know, I've got a horse in this race. <laughs> I, well, I'm unbi- I'm unbiased too. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to see no fighter with their freedoms taken away from. Them. I don't want to see no fighter. Like when was the last time we had a fighter that was they they everything was taken away in their prime outside of Muhammad Ali? Right. You know, like no one wants to see that. And you may have to hang someone in public. Exactly. But no one wants to see that. I don't yeah. want to see that. Nor do I want to hear about someone popping sure. positive for steroids either. Because when you when you as a as a fighter, as a trainer, as you going through these emotions with your fighter in camp, you go through a lot of different things in camp, okay? And you go through hurt days. You go through great days. You go through sit down. We all sit together as a team. We all got to, hey, 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 y'all doing too much here over here. Yeah, Like, we got to have a team meeting. So there's so many things that happen in the training camp. And when it all boils down to it, we want to keep the, the common goal is for not only for us to just win. The first thing we want to do is keep our guys safe. Mm-hmm. So when we got somebody on the other side that, that already – we already seen him stick the knife in the waistband. We seen it once already. So how comfortable are we going back to the, you know, to the table again? And now we don't see the knife in the waistband, but we already have knowledge that it's there. And because he wasn't punished with such a harsh penalty, what's keeping him from doing it again? Right. And that that's the thing about it. We want to the goal is to keep Someone from doing it again. If you steal from the store back in other countries, uh, when I was growing up, they used to say, if you steal from the store, they'll cut off your hand. Saudi Arabia. Yeah, Saudi Arabia, they'll, they'll cut off your hand. But you don't steal stuff there. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because the penalty was so harsh. Right. It was so harsh that they said, you know what? If we make it this harsh, we can, we can deter people from doing it. And we can't complain about the guy with the missing hand. But look at all the stuff. This look look at how the city is safe, right? So let me ask you this: So, you know, whether it's MMA, boxing, in your opinion, is it possible? Like the Canelo, didn't Canelo test positive? It was meat, for, man, for something that came from. Is is that possible in your opinion, or is it always intentional? And I'm not just saying about Canelo. Right. There, it happens all the time. Like you know, it happened with John Jones. It happened. Uh, there's an MMA fighter on the Connor card, Sean O'Malley, had the same thing. Is it always intentional or is it? Because I'm not, you know, right. I'm not a doctor. I'm not educated in that. But can exactly. it get in them unintentionally? Um, I would say this, okay. Yes and no. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I don't know too many high-level fighters in boxing. We're talking about boxing. Football. That's, let's start there. I don't know too many high-level fighters that have a cook in their kitchen and they don't know their reputation. Right. I, I, it's not too many of them. So if you're making the big bucks, so you are on a high level, if you got a cook in your kitchen, I guarantee you, if not the manager, if not the promoter, advisor, whoever, they, someone knows everything about the person that's cooking his food because he's the meal ticket for the everybody. Sure is. Right. So when you have that, you know every detail about this person. So when this person, when this fighter get popped and say it was in the food, somebody's lying somewhere. Right. Mm-hmm. Or because, even- it, because either it was intentional or it was, and we got caught unintentionally. 
Yeah, because you hear the food and then you hear the, uh, what's the other one, tainted substance yeah. or supplements. Now, look, there are there are facilities that have, you know, that run a lot of products and you know, they might not be certified that, that you could have some of those things happen. But no, when you test positive for three and then it becomes four and then it becomes five, come on. Man. Yeah, this one, this one's about the easiest. I, I mean, I don't even remember the last time you saw this many stairs. No, you didn't. He set the record. He set the record. He set the record. Well, moving on from that. Unfortunately, you know, we got stuck there talking about that. But it's a big subject, and it's a serious subject. It is a very yeah. serious subject. And there are guys that are out there that are, you know, versed enough to know how to beat that stuff. But anyway, moving forward, I think it's a lifetime ban. I think it's criminal charges. I think you start doing that, and you start fixing the sport quick. Very quick. Uh, Jonathan, you trained the likes of uh, Gennady Golovkin, the Klitschko's. Uh, I've had the fortune of being around you during the, some of the Triple G training camps. What my intrigue is... Is what the Klitschko's are like. Um, you train both of them? No, I actually I train Vladimir. Vladimir, I the was, younger of the two. I was, um, I fought on Vitaly. When Vitaly fought Ariola at Staples Center. Okay. Keep in mind, he's the only heavy, heavyweight that sold out of Staples Center every time he fought there. Wow. Um, oh, they were a draw, huh? Yeah, definitely. Um, I fought in the undercard, but I also was the sparring partner getting ready for the for that particular fight. So um, that's how I started off. I was um, I was with Emmanuel, and Vladimir was getting ready for. I want to say this is two thousand four. I was having my second fight, and he, Vladimir was getting ready for the Vero Williams. The Vero touched touch to sleep. Yeah, and so that ended in a brutal hit. But uh, Vladimir was up ahead on scorecards. I'm going scorecards. Fight is over. Okay, go to the next camp. He's um, Elisa Castillo went to heavyweight, fought Michael Moore, beat Michael Moore, won a little North American title. And Vladimir said, okay, I want to get that title, then I'm going to go for another title. So as she was getting ready to fight Elisa Castillo, Manny said, this kid's like a cruiserweight. You can spar JB. So it flew me out to Spain, and that's when our, connect- that's when our connection mm. really started. Um, when I got to the hotel, put his arm around me, he said, you know what? We're going to be really close. I can feel it. And I just laughed at him. Because so you were his sparring partner. I was his sparring partner. I started off sparring him because he wanted speed. I was at that time. I was about one hundred and ninety four pounds. I was just turning. I was just leaving the amateurs, turning pro to be at a uh, cruiserweight. Mm-hmm. And um, I started off. Started off sparring him. Many fights when he, the fights he had with Chris Bird, turned southpaw, sparring him for that. So I knew him very well. By the time came for me to um for me to work with him, I was just right here in Detroit. I was going to the Kronk gym, and I put him in front of the gym. My phone rang, and I told the guy, "Hold on, close the door." Um, Vlad called him, so I called to see what um, and I said, "Hey, what's up, bro?" He said, "JB, I need we need to talk." So I sat in the car. I said, "What's going on?" He said, "I need a coach." I said, "Okay." He said, "I want you to be the coach." Wow. I said, "Wow." Okay. He said, um, "Did you hear what I said?" <laughs> I said, yeah. This is the exact the way the conversation went. I said, yeah. He said, um, so what do you say? I said, okay. He said, you know what I said to you. I but said, I know what you said to me. Yeah, that's about as much enthusiasm as you usually show. <laughs> <laughs> he said, um, you going to do it? I said, of course. He said, JB, let me ask you something. I said, what's that? What make you think you do it? You've never trained nobody before. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I said, well, Vlad. You're not asking me to teach you a golf tournament. I said, this is boxing. Yep. And, um, you know, it's okay. I mean, he said, so you sure you can do this? I said, yeah. He's okay. I'll call you back with details. I said, okay. Wow. So I walked in the gym. Now, at this point. You were still fighting. I'm, yes. I'm completely nervous out, out of my mind right now. <laughs> because, I'm like, honestly, I help people in the gym. They, my name is John standing in the corner and telling them what to do. I've done little things. Wow, that never, was your first day. That was I, your first job. I, I've never trained a <laughs> well, fighter. I didn't know that. I've never trained a fighter. I before. didn't know that. Like I've never even really held pads before. <laughs> oh my you know, god! But I, don't get me wrong. I have seen it done so uh, hundreds of times. Wow, you were on Manuel Stewart traveling with Emmanuel, so I've seen it done. So I walked. In, I walk in the gym, and um, the late great Keith Lee. He's a Detroit legend. He's a hell of a trainer. I used to always talk to him. All the old school guys. This is what I miss about boxing. The old school guys that's in boxing used to sit around the gyms and give the wisdom to the young guys so they could be the older guys one day and give them wisdom because right. they usually pass down. Sure. So I said, 
I don't know what to do. He said, what are you talking about? I said, uh, Vladimir McClisco just called me, asked me to be his trainer. I said, really? Wow. He said, what do you say? I said, I told him, yeah. He, said, <laughs> he looked at me. He said, son, come here. He said, you can do it. He said, you've been around us since you was, since, since I could remember. He said, you can do it. And I believe in you. That's all I needed. Wow. For someone of that magnitude, for me, from for someone that I looked up to, to say that, that's all I needed. That's I, huge. I, it was nothing else that happened that any doubt ever came in at any point of that of that journey. Even when I got there, he said, you know what, I changed my mind. I think I'm going to go with someone else. I said, okay. Um, when you want me to go home? Uh I want you to stay. <laughs> I said, okay, like, why you want me to stay? <laughs> and um, he said, you know, I kind of want you. I, I heard you got to fight. Yeah. Um, I said, yeah. Um, I fight a week apart. I said, yeah, you fight November 10th. I fight November 17th. Wow. He said, um, it's kind of tough, ain't it? I said, yeah. The fight's in the States. Yeah. I think I'm going to go I'll go another way. I said, okay, well. If you want me to stay here, I said, Vlad, we already talked. You would have to bring my whole camp here. He says, no problem. Just, wow. Um, call time to him to take care of me. I said, you sure? He said, do I ever say something twice? I said, okay. <laughs> I said, okay, I'm just, I'm just making sure, you know, so. Um, well, that's a great story. I call Sugar Hill. I said, Sugar, listen, X, Y, Z. I tell him the situation. And now keep in mind, this was a very emotional situation because you got you got Vladimir, you got myself, you got Sugar Hill. This is after the passing of Manny, of course. This is before. This is before the passing this of Manny. This is before. He's in the hospital at this point. Oh, okay. He's in the hospital. Did you ever consult with him? And I talked to him once. He, um, Vladimir talked to him once. Mm-hmm. Vladimir um, told him, said, do you want me to just train until you get out? Because the plan was um, train, when Manny get out, he take over, finish the camp. That was that was everybody's thought process. Wow. So when he asked me to train him, as um, soon as I held the pads, he just dropped his hands. He said, I fucking knew it. He said, this is it. This is it. So, wow. Okay. That, was, that was that. Came on. So... But in the camp, Emmanuel passed. Sure. So now, the the um, the training got a little bit more intense between. Because now, keep in mind, I have to train at five a.m. because I'm getting ready for my fight. I train Vladimir at eight a.m. So me and Sugar. I was going to ask you what so, you did first. So me and Sugar Hill is up working. Then, as soon as I finish, I go change my shirt, come back to the gym. With Vladimir. Exhausted. So like me and, Superman. Right. Me and Sugar Hill spent the most, like, on an intimate level time together. Just us. Because um, it was just an emotional situation for, for, yeah, for us. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, it, it was crazy. So, um, but going through that and just being in his corner for the fight, it was, it was like... <laughs> It's hard to explain, but my first real fight was the Marius Bach fight. That was the first time I went into a camp with a fighter, trained them for that fight. That's, that's unheard of. Organized the sparring. Like, I, no, I that's unheard of. Sparring. I did all that, and my his fight week was my last week of sparring. So I had to bring all my sparring partners to his fight week. Wow. You know, I had to bring all of them. And one of the sparring partners, one of my guys said something to me that I'll never forget, Jamil McClain. Yeah, yeah, great yeah. Great friend of mine, great guy. He said, come here, kid, let me tell you something. He said, do you know what you're doing? He said, you don't know what you're doing. Let me tell you, if you pull this off, your life will never be the same. Yep. He said, you got Vlad, dude. And you go fight a week later. He said, do you realize? Unheard. He said, if you pull this off, your life will never be the same. And I just looked at him. And I, and I understood him. Yeah. But... I always live by a code that when I'm in the moment, I just give everything in that moment. Sure. So I don't look beyond that moment because I'm in the moment. I don't look beyond it. And looking back at it, it's still kind of an unbelievable situation. 
you know, but I just lived every moment of that moment. I just lived it to the fullest. Wow. And then, uh, and then you, you, uh, Vida, uh, Vladimir finished his career with you. Yes. Yeah. How long will you stop fighting? It's been almost, what? It's been a minute, I feel About like. About five years, years, six years? Two, three, four Oh, years. that's it? Something like that. Oh, wow. Uh, all right. One more. Emmanuel Stewart. Oh, my goodness. I asked Tommy Hearns this. Okay. I'm going to ask you the same exact question I asked Tommy. Okay. Was he as good as all of the hype around him? Was he? Did he live up to the stigma around him? He exceeded it. That's the same exact answer Tommy Hearns gave. And the reason, I'm going to tell you why. That's the same answer Tommy gave. Because one of the things that Emmanuel let me in on was the people he put around him. Emmanuel, the same as the Dan Gilberts, the Johnson, the C, same as the CEOs. What he did was he had a seed that he wanted to plant. And to grow this seed, it's really easy to grow a seed. But to grow a garden, that's the hardest thing to do. It's harder than just growing a seed. But it all starts with the seed. So he had he allowed himself to and he surrounded himself with not he didn't make sure he didn't surround himself with nothing but weeds. He made his, he surrounded himself with roses. Because out of a rose bush, you get weeds here and there, of course. But out of a rose bush, you get a bigger rose. And that's what he wanted to continue to create and continue to move forward with. And his I, ideals and the way he saw things, mm. when he saw you, he didn't see you, but he saw you. He saw you 20 years from now wow. when he looked mm -hmm. at you. That's what made him who he was. He didn't see you as you were today. Yeah, he saw the clothes you're wearing today, but he don't see you as you are today. It's like um, it's like um, those things you gave me one day. Like it's a video game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like right. I'm standing in one place, but when I put these um, goggle things on, I'm looking at something totally different, like a video game. I'm standing in the same place. I don't change positions, but my vision changed because I put something over my face, and it's the same. He see who you will be tomorrow. And that's the way he treats you. That's wow. how he worked with you. When he got with Lennox, he told me Lennox could be the best heavyweight. I said, really? Just got knocked out by Oliver McCall. You know, that's what I'm thinking. And he trained he trained Oliver McCall. Oliver McCall knocks out Lennox. Oliver McCall just goes crazy, do what he want to do, whatever. Lennox calls Emmanuel. He for the rematch. Emmanuel trained Lennox. For the Oliver McCall rematch. Lennox wins the rematch. That was a fun McCall quit in the fourth, yes. right? And he goes on. Lennox goes on to make history. Tear. With the Emmanuel Stewart. Mm -hmm. So I tell you this. This shows the level of his greatness. You got a very a very a lot of trainers take a fighter from zero to a hundred, world titles, this, this, all these accolades, great. They do it once. Right. Mario done it several times. It's difficult to take a, a fighter from from start to world title contentions to world titles. It's difficult to do that. And then to do it over and over again, to do it back to back because you have a system that you believe in and a system that works. And I was very fortunate to be able to be a part and to be in that system. Mm. Doesn't you remember Emmanuel Stewart? Big oh, fight yeah. Man. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Tommy was uh, cracking us up about him. Uh, what was it? He always give a good pep talk in the middle of the fight. Yelled him to go knock knock so and so out, saying, get on the plane and go home. Mm -hmm. If you never seen them two together, you don't know what, what <laughs> laughter is. Really? <laughs> Emmanuel Stewart and Tommy Harris, together after all of they went through, we right. traveled from. Um, from I think New York to Philly together or something. We riding in the car. Tommy picking on the man. God damn, Tommy stop leaving me alone. It's, it was hilarious. Sure. And the wow. biggest 
memory I have with them two together. I walk in the Staples Center with them two. With Emmanuel Stewart and Tommy. As we enter the arena from up top, we come down walking down the steps. When I say the energy. Oh, I bet. That was lifted in that place. Mm. Unreal. Wow. And that's when the idea hit Emmanuel. Tommy, we could start doing them. We could start going around the country doing the tours. They end up doing around the world doing different tours. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Well, you know, the the Tommy Hearns, um, he ended up he, he worked with Sugar Ray Leonard also. Yeah. Then I remember later he started working with De La Hoya, worked with Prince Nassim for a while. Yeah. Um Oscar De La Hoya. I yeah. mentioned that De La Hoya. Uh, you know, he had the who's who coming to him to train him. Of course, yeah, Lennox. Um, I remember, I remember. Uh, Don't forget Miguel Cotto. That's right. He did have Cotto. Yeah, 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 Cotto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was after his father passed or before his father passed? 2009, I want to say. Yeah, so it had been after Cotto's dad passed. He went to, he went to Manny. Right. But the, the, the level, the level of, um, uh, Education and, and you said it, it's a lot more teaching than it is, or coaching as it is training because there is a big difference. Because there is a big difference. I never was able to to have that insight, and I had a couple opportunities to be around him, and I just didn't. And that was one of my biggest regrets. That and not meeting Muhammad Ali personally. Yeah. Um, and I let those opportunities go, but just being a fly on the walls. So how long did you train under Manny? Um. Ninety. Six, he wanted to know who was the waterway to win the Golden Gloves, the Detroit Golden Gloves. And that's when I met him. So about 98, 99, I was in his amateur, I was a part of the amateur boxing program. And from that point on, I was around him because he took a big interest in the amateurs. Mm. Well, he did. And, and at, well, the way that I met Jonathan is I had, uh, I actually coached the New York State Golden Gloves team. So the New York State's the city and then the rest of New York. So I was the rest of New York was based out of Syracuse at that time. Right. I coached it for five years. But one of my personal guys that I trained uh, was a light heavyweight. And you and him always ended up in the same, of course, division at light heavyweight in the amateurs. At uh, uh, well, I think we were in either Lenexa, Kansas, or at the Gloves. And I remember they said Jonathan Banks is the guy that everybody's looking at, you know, for this – and I remember I watched every one of your fights. I was like, I pray to God the guy <laughs> does not fight this kid. And, you know, I, I, I'll i be honest. I was trying to pull a Tanya Harding on you. I was going to <laughs> slash your calf or slash something because I did not want to run into that. And I was like, and you won it that year. Uh, we ended up, I think, in fourth. We lost in the quarters. Okay. Um, but but you were I mean you you you're one of the trainers today and one of the few trainers today that not just walks the walk or talks the talk but you walk the walk and you've been there and then being around the tutelage of Imani and being around all of these guys that's really what attracted me and I thought was just a great uh, a chemistry aside from the chemistry it was a great fit for Badu when the chemistry hit and then I saw everything work man it's a wrap and I think you're how old are you now Jonathan man. Just turned 39 a couple of days ago. Stop it. You're not 39 years old. Just turned <laughs> a couple of days ago, 22nd of June. 39 years old. Yeah. Happy belated. Thank you. Thank you. I called you on your birthday? You did, but you ain't know it was my birthday. Oh, that's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. Cause anytime <laughs> Don't tell from, me that. Anytime you hear from a man, you're just happy to hear from him. Incorrect. <laughs> Like seriously, anytime you hear from them, I, and I'm not the I'll guy. I'll plead the fifth. I'm not the guy to tell. <laughs> they like to tell people. I don't even like to hear happy birthday because it's like it's a day. Whatever. Right. Let me just let me be in my own moment to be what, thankful. And what day was going. that? Twenty second of June. Twenty second of June. What day? What? What? Okay. Tuesday, Tuesday. Okay. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. As many was, calls as you make, it <laughs> it isn't still gonna be there. I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you something. The twenty second of June. Okay, there's the 25th of June. Hang on. 24th of June. Look at this. Here's the 22nd of June. To Badu. Champ, salam alaikum. Don't forget it's JB's birthday today. Oh, wow. Nice. Badu, alaikum salam. Thanks, bro. I congratulated him and called him five hours ago. 
See, not only do I remember your birthday, but I remind people of your birthday. How did you remember that? Because I have it in my phone. <laughs> I didn't remember anything. Um, I'm but no, so the, the, the point being, at 39 years old, I mean, before 40, I, you know, trainers make it in their 50s. Is when they start getting the recognition, their 60s, and when they get later in life training right. because they need a long time of, of a track record, you know. Um, and I think where you are, and 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 where you're, uh, what you've done so far this early, I mean, it's just astonishing. It really mm. is. And, and and you are one of the best trainers in boxing. Today. Well, thank you. Tell uh, me about Gennady Golovkin. You when you well, by the way. That was after Klitschko. That was the first big name that you worked with. Yes, I remember they had a public. Well, first they announced that Gennady was looking for for a trainer after he had the mm -hmm. he separated from his old coach, and 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 they brought Banks. And I was like, that's an odd choice. Why would he go with him? And then they had a public workout maybe a week or two before the fight, and I saw Gennady bouncing, and I saw him moving. It was an outdoor workout. Uh, I don't know if you remember yeah, what it remember, was. Yeah. It was an outdoor workout. He was moving and bouncing. I said, wow. I didn't know the kid could move. <laughs> I didn't know he could because he was so flat-footed. Right, exactly. But I saw him moving, and I said, man, that was, man, maybe that was the right fit. Yeah. Um, I think working with someone like Triple G is, is the same as working with a Vladimir Klitschko and a Bobby Jack. You got a guy who just wants to, wants to win, wants to compete. You know, um, I didn't, when I got the call to, I didn't get the call to be his coach. I got the call to, uh, as a person of interest mm. to possibly be willing, to, if, if I'm willing to, the interest is there. I said, well, are you interested? They asked me, am I interested? I'm like, yeah, the interest is there. They said, oh, you sound pretty excited about it. I said, yeah. That's about as interesting. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's exactly. This is exactly the king of indifference. <laughs> this yeah. is exactly you know the way I was the way I was talking. But um, so when it when the situation came up, they said, "Well, we want to bring you out for at least a workout for a couple of days to see him and chemistry because it's important that chemistry gel together." Yada yada yada. I said, "Oh, okay." I said, "What day are you looking at?" I said, "What day are you available?" I said, "Well, let me close up some things here, finish up some stuff, and." Um, like I will send you a text in a few hours about a date. I text them the next. I didn't send a text a few hours. I text them the next day. Of course, bank time. Because yeah. I forgot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, we're used to that. Bank time. Uh, yeah. But um, I sent them a message. He said, "Okay, great." Uh, so I flew out to meet with him, bags in hand, getting ready to work out, thinking about it. But we said I had a conversation. Me, G, translator, his brother. Um, the other people, part of the promotion team, said they had a conversation. He stood up, shook my hand, and he gave me a hug. He said, I'm looking forward to working with you. I said, okay. <laughs> I went home, and they said, well, can you pack for camp? I said, sure. Wow. And you didn't do a workout? Well, I didn't do a workout. Our first workout was once we was already in training camp. Wow. You know, the conversation I had, he said he had a gut feeling about me because he remember us meeting years back. Every once in a while, we we cross paths, right? You know, because of my relationship with Tom, my relationship sure. with Vladimir and Vitaly, and K two was the promotion company right. that signed him out of the mm -hmm. Olympics. So, um, so we always seen each other here and there. We always showed, you know, speaking respect for each other, and um, yeah. So we once that conversation happened. And, it's been on ever since. It's been the same. But only difference is now, like, you could tell as a when, – when fighters first get with a coach, they a little leery. But once they once they completely dive in, once they go to the deep end, they let loose. Sure. Like, the last camp – the last camp for – the last two camps for G, camp before that, and the last camp for Badu – they both did almost a similar thing. Mm -hmm. They both just let, well, you take care of it. I'm on. Like right. certain conversations, we would say, okay, I, I make sure I do this. I make sure I do. They're like, the next thing you know, oh, you take care of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, no. You, you go ahead. You could do it. Come, they letting, they they easing down. Right. They're coming down. down. They, they, they're getting a little comfort 
with who you are and how you how you choose to do things. And you couldn't ask for nothing better than that. Right. Wow. That's well, cool. What do you got coming up now? Um I just got a mirror coming up. That's about oh, it. Oh, <laughs> that's enough. Oh, uh, that's about it. Right now we have um I've been hearing I don't like I don't talk rumors, so I've been hearing rumors about, you know, my phone been ringing. Mm-hmm. Been hearing rumors, so we'll see what happens. Is like there a, is there a trip overseas? It may be. Mm-hmm. Maybe, <laughs> maybe a trip overseas, I don't know. Um, but we'll see. Only time to tell. Obviously. Yep. Time has the biggest mouth. And it tells everything. So I was hoping that we could announce it here. It's not that, done yet, huh? That would have been great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I would have enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, but um, it's not a done deal. It's not. A, it's not. It's not anything official. Okay. So until it get official, you know. And then we've got uh, anything on the, on the books now for Gennady? As of today, I haven't. Nothing has been signed. Yeah. So um, I know he's trying to get. His promotion company is trying to get one of the guys on his um, promotion, Ali, a fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Ali wants to fight. Are you soon. training Ali also? Yes, Ali you are wants to fight Ali. soon. So um, he I had a good outing last one. He yeah, just got clipped. I believe Ali. I, this is the, um, the conversation that I had with Amir when it comes to Badu camp. Um, when I told him there's too many chefs in the, mm. in the kitchen. Now, don't get me wrong. I do believe that if you have 10 of the best chefs, you can have some good food. Right. But not on one, not on one pot. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that. You know, that is, it's something about, I don't care if one chef do a horrible pot. I still believe that you should have one chef do it. He may be, he may be able to doctor it up and fix something, you know, but when you got everybody or more than two people giving out instructions, especially when it comes to boxing. Right. Because everybody wants to knock out. Mm. No one wants to sit back, take a look at a strategy and how to calculate things. It's not just about punching. If boxing was all about punching and that's it, then these championship belts would be passed around like turkey on Thanksgiving because everybody would just walk right. out the street sure. and be able to do that. So the hiccup Ali had was he had eleven he had eleven rounds in the books. And, <laughs> and the last round I asked him to do something. And two other people stand was telling him to go for the knockout. So he he heard knockout. So he said, Okay, I go for the knockout. Oh, the, he walked into and something. Walked into a punch that that was there all night. But when I when I say strategy, when I, I don't mean the way you move, how you move, it's the way you know how the situation goes. If I catch you, if I hit you on your stomach in the first round, he's dead. In the sixth round. <laughs> Probably. And we still we still boxing. When round twelve come up, I'ma go back to that same shot because I know you can't take it the same as you took right. it in the first round. That's the that's the um, the common denominator that, that you look for when you go through plus and minuses when you go through everything that you can go through in the fight and no one else thinks of that. Mm. That's the reason why you should have one voice in the corner because right. no one's thinking of the outside of the box or what if what if you get caught? They're right. only thinking about you catching your opponent. Yeah, and they're not thinking of nothing coming back. So before he could throw. His shot, something came back, and yeah, he was winning the fight convincingly. Yeah, he just couldn't recover from yeah. it. Yeah, mm. well, interesting uh, development with him. Hopefully, he'll uh, he'll be back strong. Great I kid, hope so he's really yeah. good kid. I don't, I don't think this is a a terminator for him, but I just hope it's a um, just learning, a learning lesson. Yeah, it needs to be a learning lesson, and I believe he he better go on and do some good things in the sport. Dustin was a, uh, a collegiate uh, football player. Uh, Many so years ago, before nice. the gray. And, <laughs> That's and why he forgets a lot. He suffers from CTE. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So he's got. <laughs> he's way worse than I am. <laughs> I'm bad, but he makes me look like Einstein. <laughs> mm. 
No, I'm, I'm great there. Well, Jonathan Banks, we appreciate you swinging by. Oh, OSP, anytime. I love it. When I rolled up, seeing the building, I jumped for joy. I started to get out. <laughs> I started to get out the light and just run to the building. I said, ah, oh, that was my people right there. What's the JV's awesome, plans for uh, the weekend here in the D? Oh, my goodness. You know what? I think I'm going to sit back. And finally, be like this. I think it's gonna be my first, the first Fourth of July, in many years being home, that I don't have a garage full of fireworks. <laughs> Wait, are, are fireworks legal here? Yes. Huge. Yes. yes. Not I, everywhere I go, the people laying off fireworks. I it's, used to put on. Erupts. I used to put Just on wait. shows for fireworks. I used to put on. <laughs> you I were that guy. Down the whole block, <laughs> and I would put on. Me and my brothers would put on the whole show. Everybody oh, we gotta get wait until this like weekend. This. You'll hear oh, it's, my it's bad all on. weekend. Wow. Oh, I mean, I mean last horrible. weekend. Yeah. Yeah, because this is going to air after. CTE. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I told you. Wow. Wow. What you got coming up, OG? A lot of golf. Oh. That, let me ask you something. Peak season. Let me ask you something, honestly. Is golf a sport? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? No, no, it, don't look at OG. Don't worry about the OG. <laughs> I will tell you this. He looks tough. But he's a nice guy. I will tell you this. I played golf once. I was in Spain. <laughs> and I played golf once. Is it a sport? Did you get tired? Did you have to get in shape for it? Golf is a sport. What? My God. He'll be back. Golf is a sport. He'll be back on here. I know a lot of... Um, I mean, you got a lot of people who it's a hobby who started playing golf because of, they seen certain other athletes play golf. Yeah, right. Athletes after they retired played golf. Just like is Not chess Tiger a sport? Woods. Is chess a sport? What about Tiger Woods? That's who I look at when I say it's. it's oh, you know, well, some of those can't look at Tiger Woods. But no, that's, you know, that's some of the what I have to when I look at look I at I Jack go Nicholas. Look at Jack there Nicholson? are PGA Tour Nicholson. players now that work out with MLB players and squat more than them, bench more than them. Oh, swear God. to God, Brooks now, Kepka. I think you got more <sighs> guys playing golf at a high level and better shape than you guys guys playing baseball. I think them guys. No, baseball running, is much more <laughs> athletic running, than golf. Running, you know, I'm not hating on golf. I'm just telling you, it's guys. not. I don't consider it a sport. Well, you gotta, you gotta walk five to seven miles up and down hills. Yeah, so does the senior citizen club. at the mall. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean well, those mall walkers. That's, so they're, they're I, athletes. I will, I will say this. Oh. I, I get what you're saying. I do because you and know I got the Trump our, card, our chess though. players. I got the Trump oh, card. Go ahead, here, please. Though. Look at how would you consider the Olympics sports? Are the Olympic sports? Of course they're sports. I mean, that's going to be the easy answer without you loading this question. Yes. <laughs> there are several sports in the Olympics okay. that take less athletic ability than golf. Such as? Archery. You stand there and shoot an arrow. Archery is not a sport. It's in the Olympics. Okay, it's in the Olympics as probably like a high. Isn't golf in the Olympics also? Yeah. Yeah, right. But you said that, the Olympics are sports. Wait, I said sporting. Wait, but you say well, <laughs> boxing's in the Olympics, hockey's in the Olympics, basketball in the Olympics because those are sports. They're sports. But Olympics doesn't. I mean, yes, it is considered a no, no. Wait, <laughs> it's trying to talk himself out of this one now. <laughs> but it encompasses all, all of those activities. <laughs> I have to go with archery. I think archery is a sport. I thought I, the first thing I said. Archery How the sport. hell is archery <laughs> a sport? The first thing I said, archery and sport, until. Um, we signed up for archery, tur- archery <laughs> thing. And when I seen, when I went to archery tournament, have you ever been to archery tournament? <laughs> it's just like the Golden Gloves. Who are you asking? It is just like the Golden Gloves. Stop it's just it. like the Nationals. Stop these it. These people come from all over. Yeah. For archery. And these, listen, I went, these kids, they be pulling them things out and shooting them like in It's a insane. skill. It's, uh, how about, what, what, the, clay shooting. Is that a sport? Yeah. It's a skill. Clay shooting, chess, uh, 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 archery. It is a skill. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't. I would even go as far <laughs> as bobsledding. Like, what, what 
physical activity in bobsledding. You got to push the cart a little bit, and you can jump inside <laughs> of it. And it's it, it, crazy, folks. Do that. So is going. NASCAR a sport? No. <laughs> How is that? Na- what do you got to do to be in shape to be NASCAR? I'm not saying whether it's there goes or not. 74 million viewers. Exactly. <laughs> Wait, it's an activity which we love. <laughs> you know, but there, but I, I think I think a sport has to be defined as physical exertion, uh, athletic ability, or athletic agility. Um, you know, I think that there has to be a physical element of it. I, that's there just is, how I look. But that's because that's the era. That we come up in. But if you take this new post, anybody come from 89 to 90 era, anybody born after 1990, they don't look at it like that. They look Uh, at it completely different. Wrestling. That's a sport. You got to make weight. You got to, you know, it's physical. It's, you know, boxing, football, basketball, uh, uh, all of the track and field, you know, sprinting, uh, 100, 400, you know, every hurdles. Those are sports, man. I bet if we went out this weekend, Mm -hmm. 90 degree weather, and you had to wear pants and a shirt, and you had to walk the golf course, you would be exhausted by the time we were done. Okay, one. If I'm going to go out in 90 degree weather, I'm not going to wear pants. They do. Okay, yeah, but they have to? Yeah. They have to wear pants? Okay, fine. You know, put that aside. (laughs) So the fact that he's hot doesn't I've, make it a sport. I've seen you after your runs and workouts. Right. Y- but wait, you're at, dying. The fact that they you have to wear pants. You were sweating in here an hour on oh, Monday out here. Right? It was a hard run. Listen, how about, how about, how about. Uh, horse Gotta t- laugh out of Johnny for how that about, one. How, <laughs> how about horse jockeys? Are those sports? That's a fine line. No, no, that's a fine line. Because there is a little bit of. You got to be a little bit of shape in there. You got to have some strength for that. I would say this. Any of the. Because of the environment I come up in and the sport that I grew up in was boxing. I was always told, man, you don't got no job. Boxing ain't no job. Ain't no real job. So for anybody, they consider what they do, whether it's archery, anything, if you consider it a sport, I let you have it. It's a sport. How about if that's this? how? You so if I it. stand in a garage, I can say I'm a car because I consider myself. <laughs> if you could start up and take me somewhere. Else. <laughs> <laughs> how about this? If, if you can find it on ESPN.com, it's a sport. Nah. <laughs> if they have it in the Olympics, you can consider it a sport. Right. You got you got so many people. Hang on. What is it called? It what is it called? Sport. No, no, no. What is it called? The Olympic what? But <laughs> yeah, but but it's the Olympic Games. Okay, but so is a golf. Basketball there game. it is. We can stop but right there. No. Yeah. So it's, so is a basketball game. Yeah, but it's a an football athletics, game. That's an athletic game. Games can. No, the fact that it's in the Olympics is because it's a game. So is shoots and ladders. So is twister. Those are all games. Get out of here with that smoke. There it is. Look it's not a hobby. Point. He finally found the. the he found his Johnny. That's my highlight ball. clip. He found the glitch in the system. That's but he, the glitch. But, gl- <laughs> but he already called it a sport. Exactly. But he already called it a no, sport. No, no. The Olympic Games, I would consider them as sports. But when you really look at it, what is it? It's the Olympic Games. So that's just games. a marketing so plot. This question for you. Your name is Dustin, but if I call you Dustin, be like, oh, that's just what my mom called me. <laughs> that's what your name is because that's what it is. But this question for you. Like Manager John? If you. If that's not what his mother named him. If you was getting paid $100 million. Yeah. To play something, and for you, they told you to, you have to call it a sport. Archery, would you call it a sport? She, that's definitely a sport. <laughs> <laughs> oh, at, so that, it's uh, a sport. Dude. Seeing that it was just the fourth, of, fourth of July, is the hot dog <laughs> eating contest a sport? <laughs> <laughs> what we we should cut this off. Of course, the next question is, is a hot dog a sandwich? <laughs> um, Jonathan Banks, thank you for swinging by. Absolute pleasure. Pleasure's all mine. <laughs> thank you, brother. OG Woods, always a pleasure. Episode five, we're wrapping it up with the great Jonathan Banks at a young 39 years old. He's already taking over a boxing, uh, destroying the set. <laughs> <laughs>
That was training. a good catch, though. <laughs> yeah, that was the reflexes. Sports. Uh, Jonathan Banks, <laughs> uh, really up and coming, uh, not even up and coming, very accomplished trainer at this at the young age of 39. I don't think I've ever seen a trainer uh, since Emmanuel Stewart that's had the kind of accolades and track record that he's had. So definitely keep a close eye out on him. Follow him on social media. Banks training camp also. Um, and that's it. We're signing off, guys. My team, my family, my OSP, and we're out. <laughs>